We all have mental health. When we normalise the fact that we do and we all have atrocities that happen in our lives and death and things that perhaps knock the wind out of our sails every now and then, understanding that that is a normal part and emotions are not to be suppressed or feared but rather to go, hey, this is part of being human, this is part of the evolution of life and if we learn how to manage that, then we're going to be in a far better situation than if we just suppress it or perhaps we use a Band-Aid approach on how we actually go about dealing with it. Absolutely. I mean, the reality of the matter is if we don't get to process where we're at as individuals, the outcome of that is actually poor mental health. Because don't forget, poor mental health doesn't mean you're sick. Poor mental health can simply be that you're not able to operate at the best possible level for you. And a big part of that is the ability to actually work through the things that are going on in your life. I mean, the vast majority of people don't come to work because that's the joy and the end game for them. It is for some people, but for most people, they come to work, they want to deliver a solid day's work, they want to get paid for it, and then they want to go home because it's at home that they have all the things that they really truly care about. And so accepting that, I think, is a critical part of working through okay, how do we make sure we get the absolute best out of our people? We give them the opportunity to shine. If we look at it at this this particular table here, this is drawn from the 2018 Mental Health Survey nationally for Australia. I don't want to dwell too much on the male-female split other than to say to you there are differences and it's important to recognise that there are differences. A long discussion around the whys isn't particularly relevant here and I'd also say to you that We haven't been collecting data in this mental health space long enough to actually be in a position to say, okay, well, we know, for example, why anxiety disorders are overrepresented statistically in females. We can't even say that that's true because we're still digging on things like if you you ask someone to self-report how they're feeling, the reality of the matter is that generally females will be far more open and transparent around how they're feeling about something whereas men will tend to suppress how they're feeling about something. Now, that's me generalising, but even that means that the statistics we have to be careful about. But the bottom line is, if we look at the three major groupings of mental health challenges, anxiety disorders, depressive disorders, and substance abuse, if we look at that in the general community, about 20% of people in a given year will suffer from one of them. That's one in five. Now, one of the reasons if you add up all of those numbers, they don't come up down the bottom, they don't add up to the right number, is relatively straightforward. And that is that many of these challenges exist together. So it's quite common, for example, to find someone who suffers from anxiety to also potentially have a substance abuse disorder because often it is alcohol is probably the most common one in the community. It's it's almost that self-medication piece. So if we're setting the scene, the first is that continuum of, okay, well, let's let's be real about this. Everybody has good days and bad days. And acknowledging that people are going to wax and wane through, that's really important. And secondly, lots of people in our community and in our workplaces suffer from mental health challenges, and we may be blissfully unaware that they do. It also helps us to understand that at no point am I going to stand here and say we make people sick. There are many, many people whose workplaces actually have nothing to do with any of the mental health challenges that they experience. And that's important for us to recognise. Whilst we don't want to create environments that make people sick, and those environments certainly exist, we also need to acknowledge that often people are bringing these things into the workplace with them. And our job is then to say, given that we're not allowed to say, well, we're not employing you because you suffer from depression, and given that that actually when we do have someone working for us who has some of these challenges, actually that doesn't mean they can't make a really valuable high-performance contribution to the organisation. It just means we need to be creating the, the right environments for that. I, I always show my people them the Holmes and Ray stress scale. And the Holmes and Ray stress scale, off the top of my head, the top 10 things that cause stress are actually not workplace related. 
Yet when I coach people, often it's the first place they go to. You know, my job is so stressful. My boss is causing me to be stressed out, these deadlines, all of those kinds of things. The homes and race scale, actually, most of the the top 10 things on there are all personal related things like death of a spouse and, you know, going bankrupt and, and different things like that. So, you know, I think that's that's also something to be mindful of. If I say to someone, how stressed are you? The default I get is personally or professionally. And I say, please tell me how that's different. You are one pillar. You are just the same pillar who oscillates between those two worlds. You're not any different. So it'd be naive to think that the underlying stress levels and the subconscious and all of those things that are going on with you just get left behind at home or at work when you do actually leave it there. And so, again, it's about getting people to understand mental health is we've all got mental health. It's one and the same. It's about learning how to deal with these things and our approach to them and the way we see things in the world that's really going to determine how you respond to stress or whether you react to stress.